July 2003, twin sisters Lardan and Larley Bijani underwent a controversial and dangerous 50-hour operation to separate their conjoined heads. Nearly 30 years of being joined together was long enough. Lale Ladan's wishes was to see each other face to face. That was their, their best dream that they ever had. Early in their lives, the twins realized they were very different people. They had different ambitions, hobbies and tastes. Both wanted separate lives. Both were determined to make it happen. They thought there was nothing they couldn't do. They thought that they could do whatever other people did. Their quest was to find a surgeon willing to separate them. Their friends, family and the man who eventually agreed to operate tell their story. This is certainly one of the greatest professional dilemmas I've had. Whatever decision we made would be very controversial. An operation never before performed on adults was carried out in the glare of the world's press. The twins were risking death for their dream. We're going to be so different after surgery. Our eyes, ears and face will all be different. How do you think we'll look? I think we'll have round faces and our eyes will look normal. We'll be beautiful. I'll have a nose job. <laughs> the twins knew their lives were at stake, but they couldn't bear to stay the way they were. Lardan and Lale Bijani had lived for most of their adult lives in the Iranian capital, Tehran. They were clever, engaging and ambitious. They had devised their own ingenious ways of coping with everyday life. The most trivial task was a major event. They just had to get on with things. In the mid-1990s, the twins were law students at Tehran University. By then, Lardan and Lale had asserted themselves as individual women, each with her own hopes and ambitions. What they shared was a dream of total physical independence. What do you want to do after separation? I want to be a lawyer, an independent woman. A lawyer for women, not men. They can take care of themselves. <laughs> and if you want, you can be my secretary. Really? After four years of studying, you want me to become your secretary? I'd rather be a typist. <laughs> At university, Lale had decided to become a journalist. Lardan wanted to stick with the law. Without separation, the lives of these two dissimilar women would become impossible. The main thing was the huge difference in their personalities. There was Lale's depression and sensitivity, and then there was Ladan's illusory joyfulness, which sometimes made her laugh so much that it annoyed other people. But the truth is that it wasn't genuine laughter. Her laughter frequently concealed intense anguish. As far as they could, Lardan and Lale led lives much like those of millions of other young women throughout the world. They loved clothes, cosmetics and dancing. But those moments of real joy couldn't be sustained. Underneath lurked frustration and distress. They were constantly wondering whether they would be separated one day, whether they would be like other people, free, so all their anguish and troubles would come to an end. 
The thought didn't simply come to them out of the blue. It was their dream and their friend's dream. But this dream had always existed. The twins dreamed of physical separation. They quite simply wanted to be able to live their own lives, with their own careers, quite independent of each other. They had so much of dreams. They have tons of dreams and how they want to go and work and they wanted to buy houses. They wanted to build their lives by themselves and as different individuals and um, be successful. To make all this become real, the twins needed help. Educated, urban and middle class, they were quite capable of pursuing their target, but they couldn't do it on their own. Their early life had given little hint of how far they had come. Lardan and Lale Bijani started life in surroundings very different from bustling Tehran. They had been born into rural poverty, a poverty from which they had been mysteriously wrenched only hours after they were born. The twins' family came from the small, isolated village of Lorazb in southern Iran. Their father, Dadola Bijani, was a poor farmer. He and his wife shared a small hut with their large family. The village had no medical facilities, so Mariam Bijani gave birth in a nearby hospital. Lardan and Lale were born on January the 17th, 1974. Their father could hardly grasp what the doctors were saying. The next morning they told us you have two daughters. I said, thank God. Then they said, you have two daughters stuck together in the head. Even so, I still said, thank God. I kept on thanking God. While she was pregnant, Mariam Bijani had been ill and heavily sedated. When she eventually came round, her daughters had already been taken away. She learned what happened from her own mother. When I came around after the birth, I did not know anything. People kept on asking my mother about the children, and she told them, we have two girls. They asked her, where are they? She said, their heads are stuck together. So they took them to Shiraz. Lardan and Lale had been taken to a better equipped hospital in the city of Shiraz, a hundred or so miles away. Here it was hoped they might be separated. Lardan and Lale were an extremely rare case of craniopagus twins. This occurs only once in about two million live births. Their condition was quite beyond the doctors at Shiraz and after three years of tests and examinations, no one was any nearer to finding a solution. The twins' parents were able to visit them in Shiraz quite regularly. Then one day, when the sisters were three, they were again suddenly and without warning spirited away. <laughs> We would see them often until 1977. Then one day, we went there and couldn't find our children. Just imagine, when a chicken loses its chick, it would call out to it. I was like that chicken who's lost its chick. I was looking for them. The twins were in another hospital 500 miles away in Tehran. It was thought that specialists there might be able to separate them. But amazingly, their mother and father weren't told where their daughters had gone. From their isolated village, the twins' parents couldn't trace them. And for years, they completely lost touch. Even in Tehran, doctors were baffled. Nobody knew what the next step should be. The twins' story was becoming something of an international curiosity and came to the attention of an affluent Tehran businessman, Ali Reza Safayan. He adopted them. 
Mr. Safayan brought up the girls 500 miles away from their home village and light years away in terms of education and social standing. They acquired a certain fame. They even met the Ayatollah Khomeini. Safayan took up the search for a surgeon who might be prepared to separate the twins. He looked at home and abroad, but no doctor was willing to try. As the twins grew older, their frustrations only increased. The strain became intolerable. Their life was really difficult. The ordinary things that everyone can do on their own, they had to do together, like they had to go to the toilet together. They couldn't watch television together. When they were watching television, one of them had to hold a mirror like this, so she could see the reflection of the television in the mirror. By the time they were 14, the twins were no longer able to put up with life as it was. They took their plight to an international neuroscience conference in Tehran. They went to the conference with Mr. Safayan every day until they found someone ready to listen, a prominent neurosurgeon from Germany. I think the, the main point of the life of them was find somebody to be divided. That was the dream of the both. They were very proud that they are managing everything. That was a very positive aspect. They showed us how they uh, run, how they take bicycle, and they play ball, they go to the school, and they are making uh, a development of intellectual uh, career. Dr. Sami arranged for tests on the twins to be carried out in Tehran and more on his return to Hanover. He kept coming back to one particular obstacle. The twins shared one major vein to drain the blood from their two brains. Dr. Sami decided that to operate in this highly sensitive area of the blood drainage system would risk the twins' lives. They could bleed to death. It took me about four weeks to make the decision because I still I was fighting with myself. Still I was fighting myself, try to find a way, you know. And, uh, but uh, uh, the more I was searching, the more I was thinking to do, the more I become convinced that it is impossible. This was an unexpected blow to the twins. They had been so confident, they had even packed their bags ready to fly to Germany. Their hopes were dashed. Lardan and Larle now faced the extra burdens of adolescence. They were ordinary people. They had all the same feelings that ordinary girls had. The idea of getting married and having children was every bit as exciting for them as it was for me and the other girls. Lodan used to joke with us about it. She used to say that she wanted to get married. But we could see that really she was interested, even if she joked about it a lot. I could see that she wanted these jokes to become reality. The twins had been determined to live as normal a life as possible, but this only led to more problems. Over the years, they developed curvature of the spine. They were terrified their spines might snap, and the problems were not just physical. They were far more distressed about social and emotional problems. One of the things which caused Lale so much suffering was the fact that people were afraid of them. I remember once we wanted to go to a party, so we went to a hair salon. But the hairdresser just couldn't do their hair because she was frightened of touching their heads. The twins' relationship was complex. They had their own characteristics and quirks, yet each depended on the other. 
They had mood swings. One moment they were very happy, the next gloomy. La Lay, especially, began to suffer from depression. But they settled into definite roles and found their own ways of coping. It was Ladan who looked after them both. Ladan always did the cooking. If they were ill, Ladan made the soup. It was always Ladan who made the appointments to see the doctor. Of course, they always went to see the doctor together. But Ladan would say, I took Lale to see the doctor. The twins' difficulties were mounting. Not only that, their relationship with Mr. Safayan was turning sour. They wanted to leave their adopted father. Mr. Safayan separated us from society. He ostracized us from it. And he blocked every window of hope we may have had. And he knew we weren't happy about that situation at all. The chance to escape came in 1996. After years of searching, the girl's biological parents finally tracked them down and made contact. By now, the twins in their early 20s were law students living in their own Tehran apartment. They won their independence from Mr. Safayan in court and custody was transferred back to their real parents. There were opportunities as well as setbacks. The twins were offered jobs on a trial basis, working on the website of the Iranian Broadcasting Corporation. Ladan would like the computers a lot. She's a lawyer, so she loves information about the world and how everything is. And Lale would love games, computer games. But after a month, the twins had another setback. They were made redundant. That incident really disappointed the twins. After that, Lala told me that we either have to be separated or die, and Ladan agreed with her. Redundancy made the twins review their lives. It rekindled their longing for separation and careers of their own. They began to trawl through the internet to find a doctor willing to operate on them. Their father, who was visiting them, watched with fascination as his daughters played with a big box in the corner of the room. I was at their house one night and asked them, what are you doing with that box? They said, we are looking for a way to separate our heads from each other. They were looking for a doctor. They wanted to do it. They wanted to be separated and free. After more fruitless months, they found the answer in a newspaper. The article was about the separation of Nepalese twin babies at a hospital in Singapore. The neurosurgeon who had performed the operation was Dr. Keith Goh. The twins emailed him. Dr. Go agreed to meet them. In November 2002, the twins flew 4,000 miles from Tehran to the Far East. Singapore. A strange and unfamiliar world to Lardan and Lale. But it was a world which offered the twins the prospect of separate lives at last. They were desperate to meet the man who gave them that hope, Dr. Go. The twins met the consultant neurosurgeon at Raffles Hospital the morning after they arrived in Singapore. To anyone who met them, they seemed to be two articulate, well-groomed, happy individuals who just happened to be stuck together. 
the world didn't understand what was going on inside their heads. They said it's almost 30 years that they've had to put up with this, and it was enough. Scans revealed that their 30 years together had taken a physical toll too. The left side of Lardan's brain had been slowly compressed against the right side of Larlay's. It was not just their skulls that were joined, but their brains as well. This is Ladan, this is Lale, and this is the plane of separation between the two brains. You can see that there seems to be a mild degree of fusion between the two brains, and, and the, this part seems to be squashed. Dr. Go explained the dangers of any separation to the twins. Although he had separated children conjoined at the head, no one had ever attempted the separation with adults. Adults' brains are less malleable than children's and need longer to recover after surgery. Separating older twins, like Lardan and Larlay, could cause paralysis or blindness. It could cause death. They said, Look, give us some time, and we'll get back to you. And I know that there were a lot of tears, but at the end of three days, you know, very calmly and coolly, they said, look, we've thought about it, and we're ready, so just go ahead. They were worn out with living like that. Their concerns about their future made them all the more determined not to let anyone stop them from going through with what they had decided. They had made their decision and it was what they wanted with all their hearts. Dr. Go was impressed with the twins' resolve but he needed time to think about the implications of any operation. I had quite a few months of struggling whether we should go ahead with the surgery or just turn them away. At the same time, I was faced with two patients who were determined to have their will done, <laughs> uh, regardless of the risk and with the full understanding that the price they would have to pay uh, could have been their lives. But even if Dr. Go did decide to proceed, surgery was still a long way off. Counselors, psychologists, and members of the hospital ethics committee descended on the twins for interviews, reports, and assessments. I need to be reassured that in fact, Laden and Lale know the risks involved, know what's, uh, what to expect. And uh, I came out very convinced that Laden and Lale are very clear in their mind that this is something they wanted to do. The hospital even hired an English teacher to make sure that Lale and Lardan understood all the issues and the risks that went with them. The twins, though, just wanted to get on with it. They had made up their minds years ago. They were asking me, why the need for uh, ethics committee? This is, to them, it's a purely <laughs> medical thing. They want to go ahead with it. I think they were worried in case the medical ethics committee would be against the operation. Will you stay with me after separation? I'll get rid of you and escape. No, I'm kidding. I'll be with you wherever you go. I've decided I'll leave you whenever we have an argument. Okay, you have to make up for all these years together. Just tell me where you are and you can do whatever you want. The twins pushed impatiently for separation and the freedom which would come with it. Dr. Go had to decide whether he could take the risk. Lardan and Larlay Bijani waited in Singapore 
while medical and ethical decisions were made about whether to try to separate them. The neurosurgeon Dr. Go used life-sized three-dimensional models of the twins, skulls and brains to help him understand their complex predicament. His examination revealed further problems. Their brain pressures were twice normal, which explained why they required frequent headache medication. I think what would have happened in the next few years as the pressure built up, that could have led to a stroke. It could have also led to pressure on the optic nerves, which would affect their vision. I mean, can you imagine if one of these girls was blind? Or if one of them had a stroke? Dr. Goh had struggled with the medical and ethical issues for months. But what finally tipped the balance was something very down to earth. I think that the key factor which made my mind up uh, to go ahead was when I had a glimpse into how difficult it was for them to sleep. It was a struggle just to get out of bed. Uh, and I, I said to myself, you know, my goodness, if this is what they had to go through every single day, uh, for the last 30 years, then we got to do something to help them. La Dan and La Lei only cared about getting their way. For the hospital authorities, it was the start of a complex and consuming task. Dr. Go began to gather a team of colleagues from around the world, highly skilled specialists who would tackle the intricacies of the twins' conjoined brains. The venture was named Operation Hope. The major issue in the brain separation was this common shared vein through which 70% of blood flow from each of the brains would come through before heading down to the neck. And one of the key points in the surgery was to create a bypass uh, for one of the twins so that each twin would have their own drainage system. After separation, there would be a gaping hole in each skull where the twins' heads had been joined. The models were also used for planning their reconstruction. You can see how the plastic surgeons would then have to work on covering this huge defect in the cranium using a combination of skin and muscle flaps. But it's a very large area, um, almost twice the size of your palm. While the twins waited for their operation, they celebrated their 29th birthday. A big party was thrown for them. Their cake symbolized their hopes for the future. We had a big birthday cake, which was two hearts, but joined at the edges, just like you can imagine to uh, uh, the way they were joined. They grabbed my hand, and <laughs> together we had to do the cake cutting. They sent me a birthday card, but in their excitement, they had written all over it about the wonderful and happy time they were having, completely forgetting to write me any kind of birthday message on the card. So they phoned me later and said, we sent you a birthday card, but we forgot to mention your birthday on it. La Dan and La Lei stayed at Raffles Hospital for their entire time in Singapore. This wasn't cheap. But the doctors waived their fees for the operation, and the hospital started a fund for the twins. It was like they were staying in a hotel. We would call Raffles Hospital, Raffles Hotel. They felt really special here that they could go shopping for themselves and uh, people hold gatherings just for them and make them feel special. As the operation drew near, friends noticed that the twins' new clothes seemed to symbolize their wish to be separate. And you see twins, we expect them to be dressed 
you know, similarly, same colours of shoes, blouses, and they did that for most of the time. But I noticed that uh, as time went on, as they were coming closer to the operation, I began to notice that they were wearing different colours. And I think they want to impress on us, no, they are two separate individuals. The twins were invited to worship at a mosque in Singapore. They confided their thoughts to the Imam. They know the risk very well, but the excitement to be separated and to live normally as um, any one of us is so great in their mind. They try their best to push the doctors not to change their minds because they have undergone these failures all their life. I mean, they have tried at uh, so many places, so many countries. They knew that it was a very risky operation, but they refused to believe that both or one of them might die. The idea that one of them might die was as horrifying as that both of them might die. Lale was afraid of surviving but losing Ladan, and Ladan was afraid of surviving but losing Lale. The relationship between the twins was always finely balanced. Some wondered if the normally dominant Lardan had swayed Lale against her wishes. Both wanted it equally, but because Lardan used to talk about the operation so much more, some people had the impression that it was only Lardan who wanted to have the operation and that Lale was sort of being forced into it. But this was not so. They were both equally happy about having the operation. As the date of the operation drew close, Dr. Goh noticed a change in the twins' relationship. The normally subordinate Lale began to take on a new responsibility. My initial impressions were that uh, Ladan was extremely extroverted. She was in charge. Uh, Lale, on the other hand, was reserved, but I came to realize that that was uh, more quiet strength. She actually emerged as the stronger, more determined one. Whereas Ladan, despite the outward show of um, being extroverted, actually carried a lot more fears. Um, so being so extroverted was her way of coping with, um, you know, the, the risk of surgery and uh, possible bad outcome. A month before the operation, the twins gave a press conference to satisfy the immense media interest. Using their friend Baha Nico as translator, Lardan gave the world a glimpse of her fears. We uh, hope the surgery will be successful and we feel uh, happy, excited and a little bit nervous, especially me. <laughs> With just a few weeks to go, the twins' anxieties grew they worried less about dying, more about surviving in a worse condition than their present one. They became more nervous. They were saying, what if I become handicapped? They would talk about the, like, what if I can't talk after the operation? You know, and I would say, silly, don't say all that. Everything's gonna be okay. They, they were getting nervous in that way in that way that, um, you know, what if they can't do something, they can't move their arm, what if they can't, you know. They were pretty nervous. 
Nothing's going to happen. But it's a possibility. No, I don't think about it at all. I'm too scared. I'm really worried, Lodan. I hope after the operation, we won't go crazy. <laughs> crazy? Don't worry about it. Just imagine they write in the papers that Lala and Ladan gone mad. The outcome of operation? Madness. An Iranian friend brought a holy cloth to Singapore. The twins believed it would bring success for the coming operation. It helped calm their nerves. It was their destiny to be the first people to have it used on them. They placed the cloth on their heads with such joy and eagerness. I cut pieces from the cloth and tied them around their wrists. They kept these on, even in the operating theater. They said, we won't die now that you have placed this cloth on our heads. They had such strong faith in it. By July, the huge international team for Operation Hope was ready for action. Dr. Ben Carson, a top American neurosurgeon, would lead the team with Dr. Go. There were three more neurosurgeons, two vascular surgeons, six plastic surgeons, and eight anesthetists. 21 doctors in all, plus 30 or so nurses and numerous support staff. There were team members from France, Switzerland, Japan, and Nepal, as well as the US and Singapore. I talked to a lot of people uh, to try and make the right decision. Um, recognizing, of course, that if things ended up in failure, that, that we would be probably hung out to dry. <laughs> um, but you see, in, in medicine, the, you can't really choose your patients. Um, your patients choose you. In the last days before the operation, Bakshi Reza and the twins' other Iranian women friends gathered to pray for the success of surgery. Lardan and Lale joined them. They were so happy. They said this time next week we will be separated and one of us will be sitting here and the other one will be sitting there. And with joy I told them, and I will be sitting between you. They sounded so happy that they were going to have the operation soon, and they told me that they would come to visit me after it. Right up to the last minute, they said to their friends, go and buy us two single beds, because from now on, we will be sleeping in separate beds. On the 5th of July, Lardan and Lale had their hair cut in preparation for their surgery. The hair was to be made into wigs to cover their reconstructed skulls. Lale drew two small sketches of herself and her sister with their hair cut. They wrote, they will shave our heads before the operation, so we will be bald and hairless. Lale also drew pictures of herself and Lardan as they would look after separation. Lala, are you tired of me? Not really, only when we argue. I see. How about you? Me? I don't like it when you're ill-mannered. Everyone knows that. Whenever you like that, I want to be separated and get rid of you. But on the whole, I don't mind it. Just before the operation, the twins issued a letter to the press. Both of us have started on this journey together, and we hope that the operation will finally bring us to the end of this difficult path, and that we may begin our new and wonderful lives as two separate people. Two lifetimes of frustration were about to end, for good or ill. It was an enormous responsibility for Dr. Go and his fellow surgeon, Dr. Ben Carson. They asked me to take care of them and to make sure that 
they would be all right. And I said, you know, don't worry, everything will be fine. And then they said, where's Ben? So he came forward and they said, please, we are your children. Take care of us like you would your own children. And he said, of course I will, you know, don't worry. Um, you'll be fine. When you wake up, everything will be all right. It was time for the twins to say goodbye to the friends who had supported them during their eight-month stay in Singapore. Lana saw a little bit of tears in me and said, Don't, why are you crying? Don't cry. We're very happy. It's nothing. Don't cry. And she said, come on, give me a kiss. And I gave her, you know, I gave her a blow kiss. They said, no, you have to give me a real kiss. And I gave uh, Lale a kiss first and then to Ladan. And then, um, and then I told them, be strong. And they hold their strong hands. And they said, bye-bye. Just before 10 a.m. on July the 7th, 2003, the twins in a huge double bed were pushed into the operating theater. A wait of nearly 30 years had ended at last. La Dan and La Lay Bijani were single-minded in their struggle for separate lives. Now they had that possibility, but only if their difficult marathon operation was a success. While they were undergoing surgery to separate them, their friends gathered in the hospital lobby. TV and newspapers fed the world's appetite. The plight of the twins touched emotions everywhere. At first, the operation went to plan. Hopes grew, success seemed in sight. After 30 hours, the construction of the new bypass vein was completed. A blockage was cleared and the blood flowed freely again. There was a great feeling of anticipation that, hey, we could pull this off. And, uh, and then we began seeing bleeding. The network of veins, venous structures around the twins' brains had burst unexpectedly. The venous structures down here, the deep part, they don't look particularly abnormal or too large. But somehow during the course of the surgery, these areas became abnormally dilated and expanded into huge venous lakes from which we had the uncontrollable bleeding. After 50 hours on the operating table, La Dan, the stronger, dominant twin, was losing her fight for life. There was really no turning back. And we had to quickly complete the disconnection and then try and stop the hemorrhage. In that situation, you know, the, uh, the tension level rises and people start working a lot faster and we knew we had to just quickly get on with it and, and finish the separation. There was nothing Dr. Go and his team could do. Soon after separation had been completed, La Dan died. But friends waiting in the lobby knew nothing of her death. They still believed the operation was going well. I was so happy I was going to see them. And then I saw the hospital staff and they told me to come up. I went to the, towards the room and I, I saw my mom and she said, look. And I, and I looked towards the bed, the, the, the side of Laudan. I, um, I saw a flower and a Quran on top of I said, what happens? She said, oh, no, then it's gone. I said, no. I telephoned the hospital and I spoke to one of my friends there. 
I could hear them all crying. As far as I was concerned, it was all over because I knew that Lale would be lost without Ladan and I dreaded to think what would become of her. Because the truth of the situation was that losing Ladan would mean the end of Lale too, because Ladan had been like a mother to Lale. Lale fought on alone, separated from her sister for the first time ever. But her independence was short-lived. After 90 more minutes, she too died from massive blood loss. The mood and the atmosphere in the operating theatre was completely flat. It was completely numb. So people cried, um, you know, there was a lot of uh, questioning. Uh, we were so close to completing a successful separation. I was numb for the first 24 hours after surgery. The next morning, you know, I I was very, very sad. I, 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 I cried with my wife. I was sitting here after lunch. My nephew just came and sat next to me. I said, tell me what's happened. Are the children dead? He said, yes. I said, God knows best. It's all in God's hands. Two days later, the bodies of La Dan and La Lay arrived in their parents' village of La Raz. Friends and well-wishers packed the tiny village. We were very moved when we see that uh, their dreams came true, that when they went back to Iran as two percent. We had really come to love these two. It was very hard to have met them and not have been touched. And I think the whole world had a glimpse of that. Will you stay with me after separation? I'll get rid of you and escape. No, I'm kidding. I'll be with you wherever you go. Even after surgery, no one will separate us. <laughs> Today, the Bowens are in Great Ormond Street, having medical photos taken. From the moment the girls were born, they've lived their life under the microscope. Can you stand next to me? The condition is so rare that doctors don't get to see real-life case studies very often. Oh. 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 